Hello sugarless Amazons around the globe. Welcome to the second episode. Oh, this time I'm taking you to an interesting trip. We are flying to England. We will be talking to Dr. Jen Anwin, clinical psychologist, low carb advocate, author of a wonderful book, which we're gonna talk about during the interview. And you might also know her as wife of Dr. David Anwin. Uh, she's going to share some interesting pearls with you and I'm sure you're gonna love her as much as I did. So let's quickly see what we spoke about. Dr. Jen, thank you so much for joining Sugarless Amazons. I definitely think that you are one of us. And Sugarless Amazons mainly talks about brave women who discovered a way to become healthier, happier, which is related to your profession. Happier is always important and also um, stronger. So uh, in your path, in, in your discovery of sugarless possibilities of life without sugar, yeah. how did it go? I read in your website a beautiful story. Could you tell us something more that we can't read in the website. How was it for you? How did you struggle and how did you win? Yeah, wow. I, I'm, I'm delighted to be a sugarless Amazon. I think that's fantastic. And with, we should probably have t-shirts with that on, I think. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> work on that. Um, yes, oh God, yes. Uh, there's, there's obviously a very long version and there's a sort of slightly more, shorter version. So I'll do the medium version, which is, that I was always, um, as long as I can remember, a child that loved sugary, carby, I mean, any food really, but p particularly su sweet things or, or sort of carbohydrates with, with butter. And I've got lots of sort of early memories of, of that and mm -hmm. trying to get as much as I could, you know. So I think it was a bit of a natural tendency in me. And looking back, uh, my mum was definitely a a sugar addict you know when i when i think about her struggles and um how she used to eat and so on so um so that was that was it was that that was always there really and then of course what that led to was being a rather overweight teenager which is a you know it's un, it was unfortunate really you know it's not when i was young there weren't many overweight kids and there was probably two of us in the school that were sort of significantly the overweight. same for me the same yeah. Yeah. and the generation of discovering the fast food you know the gen generation who grew up in the 80s and we started discovering the fast food but yes and all about is so 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 available all the sweets i think you know obviously so my parents were children in in the war and they they had rationing and um so for them it was a real treat you know when when we were growing up for them to be able to provide us with all this food and to feed us sweet things and delicious things i think that was such a sort of um in our family in particular that was you know a real how would you put it you know they were pleased to be able to do that but of course it, it swung the other way so <laughs> uh, it ended up being not such a great thing for me but then, you know, I did, and I did loads of, this will be so familiar to people that are listening. I, I did every diet that came out. There were a lot of diets in the 80s, weren't there? 70s, 80s, bonkers things like, you know, grapefruit and egg. I remember that one particularly. Yeah. All of things which you could only do, they were sort of drastic things you could only do for a few weeks. And I wouldn't even probably do them for that long. Um, so <laughs> weight, weight up and down over the years. I mean, I did manage, I'm a pretty determined person. So I did manage to keep my, I never got absolutely huge, right? It was always a struggle. I was always either on a diet, off a diet, you know, oh dear, up and down. And then really I got actually too into my uh, late 40s. And then I read a book called Escape the Diet Trap by a British GP, Dr. John Briffer. Mm. I think you can still get it now on Amazon. And that was basically a short book, but talking all about the science of sort of low sugar, low carbohydrate living and why why that worked in terms of appetite control, but also obviously blood sugars and all of these mm -hmm. things. And of course I thought, right, I'm gonna try that because I've tried everything, <laughs> you know, I'll always try new things, so I tried it. And um, jumped right in, felt, absolutely ghastly for about a week felt like i had the flu because i'd always been on a very high sugar hog even if i was 
doing something like Slimming World, I would have, um, for those of us that, for those people that know that program, I'd always choose the sort of high carb days that you could do with like unlimited pasta days and things like that. I'd always choose those because I was such a carb addict. Anyway, so this was the first time probably I'd gone right super, super low sugar, super low carb. Felt terrible, but he did say in the book that that was going to happen. So I powered through and on about day eight, I remember all the lights coming on and just thinking, ah, I feel amazing, full of energy and like, uh, you know, everything's very colorful. And I was kind of like that. And uh, <laughs> my husband was sort of, what's, what, what, what's going on here? Oh, um, so that was the beginning of it. And that was that was lovely. It was lovely to find something that did work. But then I had a few more years of and again, people might recognize this where you know, I would have relapses in a sense, or, you know, go spectacularly off the wagon, maybe at Christmas or whatever, it take me ages to, to get back on. And I was still kind of puzzling about that. Um, obviously, as a psychologist, I was puzzling about that. And why, you know, why when I'm sort of competent in other areas of my life, can I still not make this work? And then I started hearing about this concept of food addiction, sugar addiction, um and started following bitten johnson who's one of the mm -hmm. sort of world experts clinically on this and i thought right when i retire because i've taken early-ish retirement from the nhs in interesting the that you mentioned bitten bitten is my next guest so <laughs> this is beautiful oh Everything it's so connected. Good. You're, first you're dr j wrigley then you then bitten yes bitten great <laughs> i love i love dr j and he helped me a lot we can talk about that actually mm -hmm. if you want um so yeah, so found bitten. Yeah, she'll be. She's an amazing guest. I was every time I listen to her. I, even though I've trained with her, I'm kind of learn new things. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to train with bitten and really understand this whole piece around sugar and food addiction. So that's what I'm specialising in now, developing programs for people, running intensive weekends. We've got bitten coming over to the UK next year. Mm -hmm. So anyone in Europe or in the UK, you know, come along. We've got a four day intensive which bitten with bitten that will blow people's minds. I'm sure she'll mention it. And also May the 20th next year, uh, a whole day on food addiction, which is, I think, the first ever sort of international food addiction conference. So, mm. so that's what sort of consumes me now. And really just, yes, yeah, spreading the information, spreading the help so that other people you know maybe don't have to get to their late 40s <laughs> maybe oh. they could you know find this information a bit earlier or you know however old you are just to say that there is hope you know you can get free of this sugar and and, and carbohydrate trap and the the health benefits of that without sounding too over dramatic are, mm -hmm. are, are incredible you know how you how you feel all the different little things that might have um you know spoiled your quality of life really a lot of those d do just resolve if you can get a grip of this you know um over consumption of sugar grains and ultra processed foods and it doesn't even mean that you have to be a, a food or a sugar addict it's just that's that is good advice for for everybody uh, but since we call it addiction Let's uh, analyze. There is a physical addiction to sugar. It's a known thing. And there's also psychological addiction. Psychological ad addiction to sugar doesn't always have to be addiction to sugar itself because itself, because the sugar is hidden everywhere. Sugar is in starch, sugar is in fruit, vegetable, everywhere, even in liver. But Psychological uh, addiction to sugar uh, should be distinguished from physical because physical is giving us uh, control. Psychological is more difficult. And since this is your uh, field, how do we approach it from a point of view of a family and friends living among people who still consume it, who still mm -hmm. actually, who, who will laugh, like giving a beer to an alcoholic? Yeah, it's I, I know it's, it's a wide subject, but just shortly. Wide subject. What yeah, is so the shortly. best thing to say to people who are trying to force you, for example, like putting a piece of putting a piece of uh, cake in front of your nose, front and of like you, you have yeah. to, you have to. I made it. You have to. <laughs> this is such a big challenge. So you're right. So this, yes, there's sort of the 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 psychological. Uh, an emotional addiction which runs so deep in all of us. It's it's. 
like we were talking, weren't we, about how we related early on to our families and um, what food meant to us. And as children, we give kids sweet things as rewards and, and, and or if they're bored. And I mean, we really need to stop doing that because that's that's just um, putting them in the position of having this psychological addiction to those kinds of foods for comfort. Um, and that's that's you know that that's how we get into difficulties. So the psychological side. There's also, as you say, completely right. You know, there's so much evidence now that sugar has a psychoactive uh, effect in in the brain on all you know various different sort of neurotransmitters, dopamine in particular, and that's the neurotransmitter that's implicated in in all other addictions. And it's also the neurotransmitter that's important for things like motivation. So that's one thing that happens when we get sucked into this kind of food vortex. We lose our motivation for other things and we just come become motivated around food. And I know that was very much the case for me. I'd spend a lot of my days thinking, when can I next eat? What can I eat? How can I, you know, how am I going to eat it? You know, what I was kind of this chatter all the time about about food. And that's because of this psychoactive uh, properties of, of food. Mm. I think in terms of how you or I or anyone else would approach the, the treatment, it would actually be the same. So whether a person's, I mean, I don't know how you'd ever really know, is somebody more physiologically addicted? I suppose they'd get more with actual withdrawal symptoms as they tried to come off it, uh, or are they psychologically addicted? I think the treatment approach is the same. And if if you're definitely in that category of being a food addict or sugar addict, which not everybody is. Some people, there are the rare unicorns that can just have a little bit. I know, I know people who can just have a bit of cake. They're usually the ones trying to force you to have just a little bit of cake because they <laughs> think it's possible. So they're usually the ones. And then you can explain, well, you know, we're not all the same. I can't actually have a little bit of cake like you. You know, that's going to cause all kinds of problems for me. So there's, there's those people. There's some people in the middle who just culturally because of how we live they've started to have you know they they eat too much poor food but they're not they're not really addicted to it as such it's just that they they're harming themselves by eating too much of that this is what bitten will probably say to you this these three categories you know people who can moderate harmful users who are in the middle and then the the proper hardcore sugar addicts of, of which i'm one and i can never moderate however hard i try the the only treatment for me is abstinence exactly as you say exactly the way to explain it often to people is say you know with a pop person who has a proper problem with alcohol you know they 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 can't moderate if they ever start they can't stop drinking you know and all kinds of all kinds of sense goes out of the window and they get themselves in a terrible mess well we're the same as that with food so we can't just have one bite and as they say one bite's too many and a thousand is never enough mm -hmm. so um i think it can help to explain to people in some form of words like you know i i just can't moderate it or um often when people would offer me stuff at work they would say oh you know one one you know i made these and I'd say, well, it's, they look fantastic. They look beautiful. It's so sweet of you. But I, you know, and I love it, but it doesn't love me. <laughs> I can't. Oh, I can't. A very it. nice way <laughs> to express a, a gratitude, but at the same time to say thank you, Bar. But no, thank you. But no, I thanks. Love it. It's really, it's really, it's really, it's really not good for me and i i kind of know that now so I'm, I'm trying to stay away from it and most people will really respect that and after a time at work you know people they learned that that was me and that they they stopped offering it and that made it that made it a, a lot easier if you like but yeah in the early days it can be quite hard because you you do have to have some conversations like that none of us like to appear to be rude but i think the thing is you're trying to protect your your own health it seems you know you are coming from a tradition where uh, there's there's the tea time. There are biscuits. There are there's sugar in tea. There's like in every movie I see in every TV show, and I'm a huge fan of British TV shows. I can see always there's something around tea. Something's happening, and also I, I've heard from many British ladies that they ha they're having 
tea, not only at five o'clock, not only when it's the tea time, but all day long and with a long two or three spoons or cubes of sugar. Yes. Uh, and or and, uh, and or a bit uh, and or a biscuit. You know, this is idea. There was always this idea that you couldn't have a coffee or a tea without something with it kind of thing. So people have got in that habit of all, always pairing, you know, and it's probably it's probably the sh the sugar as much as the as the tea that people are, mm. you know, wanting and addicted to. And of course, you know, another another factor is that caffeine's an addictive substance. We all accept that. Of course. Um, so you get this um you know a lot of the actions of addictive substances are the, are the same in the brain like alcohol and sugar it's, it's the same area so these things can get paired so for example you know I've, I've never been much of a drinker alcohol wasn't a thing for me but i would drink alcohol because i could get sweet things like liqueurs or you know it would be that 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 i wanted would be the would be the sugar really it was an ex it was another vehicle for having sugar to have a sweet liqueur after dinner you know it's like a second pudding isn't it really and puddings is the other thing obviously in the uk we all yes we all, love a, we all love a pudding so you do have to really over and it does take time it's kind of a lifetime thing to really change that m mindset about what you want what you need and, and and what's healthy and to yes to do to do something different is you know it, it it takes time to get there and i think that's why it's important to sort of be part of a community like you know like you're doing this podcast and to other, understand that yes other people are are doing this and you you can be in a sort of club in a in a tribe of other people who don't think you're a bit weird they they they're trying to do it too and we can all support each other whatever culture or background you're coming from you can find a way to actually uh mm -hmm. leave healthy and maybe be an example. Uh, usually I'm getting, uh, my husband is a certified nutritional therapist and I'm talking sometimes to his lady clients and they are asking me how to, how to actually do the holidays, how to survive oh, yeah. and how to prepare. That's my job. I'm, I'm writing and I'm uh, exploring and I'm ketonizing. This is what I call it, the process of ketonization. Uh, and then when I come to a festive dish, like, for example, something that you liked and even retweeted, the salmon mousse, it was always keto, it was always low carb, it was always high protein. So there are those traditional recipes that still can find their place on the festive table and then uh, everybody yeah. can enjoy. And of course, you're going to train yourself. In my case, we are making everything low carb, everything ketogenic, or well, we call it KMD. Our approach is keto Mediterranean. And this is very yeah. similar to ancient Greek approach, not the modern Greek, not the one which was influenced by different carby world, as we like to call them, uh, yeah. trends. But uh, ancient Greeks, they had, this is something that I want to share with you. They had a special holiday once per month. They were celebrating uh, new moon, the day of the new moon. When the new moon is arising, they would, well, there isn't moon in the sky at that moment, but it was in their heads that they had to make a special, special cake. And it was made only on that day, once per month. And all the expensive ingredients, such as honey, which was extremely difficult to obtain back then, and uh, sesame flour, almond flour, they used almond flour, were used, not wheat flour, not other typical ingredients. And they knew they're going to eat cake on that day. This was, that was called pneumonia. So we are trying now to uh, help uh, women in particular are prone to having cake often, but any mm -hmm. uh, sugar addict or sweets addict, dessert addict, uh, we're trying to tell them about this pneumonia to maybe try it, but even when they're going to have it once per month to have a healthy version. Do you think this is a wrong approach or can it be somehow included in some sort of uh, sugar addiction? Yeah, I, I again, I think it everything's so individual, really, isn't it? That depends on the person. Yes, some people were, would respond well to that because they'd think, right, well, I can look forward to that. 
you know, I know, I know it's coming. I can make my low carb version. It's going to be fine. And the next day I'll, I'll move on with my life and carry on. Um, the, the, the sort of hardcore sh sugar act, and that would be me included, couldn't do that because if I did that, it would just make me more crazy the next day. I'd find it really hard to, I'd, it would, it would set off all of those sort of food thoughts again. And I'd, I'd, I'd be thinking about it the next day, or I'd just eat the whole thing or, you know, for, yeah. for me personally, but, but because everybody, everybody's so unique, you know, that's probably a small percentage of the population who would have to be really careful about those sorts of cheats, if you like, keto, you know, keep, keep making keto things or but sometimes for, a of, for a lot of people, it's fine. You know, f for you, it's probably fine. So I don't want, nobody has to necessarily go, go as extreme as me. And I think that's what we learn over the years, isn't it? You know, as you're doing it, what, what, what ways of eating and, and what, uh, what things really work yeah i i love i love all your stuff because it's it's about it's basically how we evolved wasn't it which was to eat real food which was sort of you know animal animal proteins and fats some some vegetables you know cook them up with delicious herbs and ancestral food <laughs> make it really tasty properly proper ancestral food and um that's really the foundation of of um, what we'd recommend for people with a food addiction problem because you just go back to what your brain was sort of naturally evolved to deal with. Our brains and bodies aren't evolved to deal with these high levels of refined flours, sugar. I mean, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have had sugar, would we? How would they have got it? It's a refined product. Exactly. Um, ultra processed foods, obviously, it's another whole level because they've got sugar, they've got um, sort of industrially made fats. They've got all kinds of flavor enhancers that the, the, the additives to prolong the shelf life of putting so the food industry wants it to yeah last a long time and it wants it to be delicious they've designed it to light up your, mm. your brain so that you want more and more whereas natural foods you know you eat, you eat natural foods uh you feel full uh and you move on so trying to sort of incorporate that in your life and as you say, as, as the as the females, we're often not always, but we're often the ones that are buying the food, cooking the food, mm -hmm. feeding the families. And I like you, I absolutely love a celebration. I love feeding the family. I had fifteen, a, a few, a, not so long ago, because it was my youngest twenty first birthday. So we did a big big old family meal. Christmas, you were saying, you know, we do, we definitely do Christmas in that way. But what we do is we indulge ourselves with more expensive ingredients so we might have wild smoked salmon you know we might get we might get some um I'm trying to think what sort of things we, we'd buy uh, you know a love a lovely rib of beef which is you know that's quite an expensive thing to have on the bone but we you know we'd have that at christmas we definitely have the the enormous turkey we make stuffing out of proper meat and and herbs um I would would make things like um, a celeriac gratin. Um, so go to more effort than I would normally perhaps, and, and as I say, spend more on the ingredients, mm -hmm. um, buy things that are sort of luxurious. So it's still a celebration, but it's not, um, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily doing all the traditional things like the Christmas pudding and the things that we would <laughs> we would have here. But uh, you know, try and try and make something else. So yeah, it's just about and and then as you say, you know, the family the family eats well as well and uh, over time over the years it, it's been amazing how our family have all caught on so all that so the youngest now is 21 but of course when we started doing this he was still a young he was sort of 10 or 11 when we first started doing low carb but slowly he's you know completely adopted it in his lifestyle as have the older kids just because they could see that when they tried it they felt better um david's mom is 86 and she's <laughs> she she eats this way she wonder uh, yeah she cooks herself you know meals from scratch with just with you know meat or fish and some vegetables and so but on. i she think does. traditional cooking actually is uh, very near to what we are both are trying to promote and especially your husband we have to mention him uh we in europe everybody in europe loves him but uh rarely uh, women outside of UK know that his wife uh, has even more to offer when it comes to, uh, well, this thing that all women want to talk about, uh, want to share, like even a recipe, even a, 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 
a photo of a beautiful meal which you prepared. And I have to tell you, you are also having some great photos. So there's another talent. That's my profession. I'm a graphic artist. Oh. So I have to tell you that you are very talented. Your photos are oh, really thank great. You. Uh, I only just do them on the phone, but I think because, um, yeah, I like, yeah, like you, I, I to love- can make miracle. I love food. I, lo- I love cooking and I haven't had to give that up at all. I think that's another thing to say to people. I think they often think, oh, you know, this, this lifestyle's ca- ca- kind of restrictive. You know, I've got to sort of not think about food at all and just eat these certain things. No, I lo- like you. I love, you know, how am I going to make this delicious? Um, like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook later for the family. I'm going to make a big butter um, chicken curry mm-hmm. and, you know, they absolutely love that and we'll you know we'll have it with roasted cauliflower or something like that so yeah I still love thinking about what am I going to cook how am I going to make it really tasty mm-hmm. um, and That's yeah I love nice. I love feeding I think- people these are like small details which make uh, life better and we can't totally totally stay away from it and eat just like a, a barbecued piece of meat or mm. something like that it's or grilled yeah, we- fish We'll fish every day yeah we have to you know we have to eat i mean that that's a, the difficulty for us really like so if you're a smoker or, or a drinker it's quite hmm. it's tough to give up but you can avoid other smokers you cannot go to the bar you mm-hmm. know you cannot have drink in the house you don't need to drink and smoke well we need to eat right so um we still need to engage with food but we just need to get to that place where we're engaging in a healthy way we're not using food this is the trick really is we're not using food for for comfort comfort or for 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 or or for any sort of emotional reasons or for entertainment food is so much sort of entertainment these days you know like at the cinema people munching on stuff or um every single like you were talking about festivals but every single one's become a festival of sugar hasn't it so we have this halloween halloween um valentine's mother's day all of those easter they've all just become festivals of chocolate over here so (laughs) it's about thinking about how you how you can do it differently and breaking this idea that you need you need that stuff you don't need that stuff it's it's kind of it's not it's not food really yeah could we talk a little bit about your book uh Mm -hmm. uh a lady a friend of mine is uh, she's overwhelmed she loves your book so what do the readers uh, get from it your story or do they get guidelines how to do it themselves yeah so what they get really is um the book that i wish had existed that what i was sort of writing in my head the book that i wish had existed had existed maybe when i was a, a teenager so it's not it's got some of the science in it, but it's not massively complicated. You know, I don't go into sort of loads of the, the background about um, how sugar addiction, how sugar, you know, affects the brain. I just tell you in basic, basic terms um, mm-hmm. how it is. And we, we do things like the date. So you're mentioning David, my husband, he's he's come up with these a way of showing how certain foods have a certain amount of sugar in it per portion. Um, even if they're starchy foods like rice and pasta and things like that. So we, we sort of explain all that. And then they get, um, they get, you get, so you get a food plan for people with food addiction problems. Um, oh, you get a screening to sort of work out which group you fall into first, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, food plan, quite a few recipes, the ones that I use very routinely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we do talk about how to break um this psychological connection uh to food so obviously if you're if you've been using food a lot for making yourself feel better when you start eating like this you're going to need to replace that you're going to need to find other ways to feel good Mm -hmm. um get some nice good slow dopamine in your life um so we talk about sort of building that up you know things like for example i think a lot of us have been thought we had to exercise to burn off calories. That's what we've been told, exercise to burn off calories. So we're all doing it and sort of not really enjoying it. But I talk about using activity and exercise, which is another fundamental human sort of Hmm. um, ancestral thing um, to feel better, to get that, those feel good 
uh, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, all of that in your life, you know, and try and build that in whatever it is that you like to do, but some sort, some sort of movement, but also other things like, you know, um, you can see all my yarn here. I'm a, I'm a massive knitter, a uh, crochet oh, that's and, nice. and, that's and an stuff like that. Hobby. Yeah. And it keeps your hands busy and uh it's very mindful it's relaxing are you working on something interesting at the moment are you knitting something nice to gift to somebody for the christmas yeah <laughs> exactly i gift them so i'm making fair isle i don't know if you know about fair isle it's a kind of um color color pattern where you you knit different colors into into patterns so i'm working on fair isle hats at the moment um there yeah, so I, yeah i've I heard about it. it that's nice it's very creative that's yeah, a way actually like singing gardening um yoga is another uh, there's quite a lot of evidence for yoga and good dopamine so i would kindly ask you to uh send me your address so i can send it to you this is oh. my Grigos keto uh frequently asked questions about keto but it's adult coloring book with Fantastic. all the yeah with all the uh well foods that are good for you and even a couple of pages of foods that are not good for you so you can use that energy to color them bad <laughs> and Brilliant. it's uh it's something that i wanted to do uh exactly as you said uh, use the creative energy do something which can also help others so i'm definitely going to send you one of these, I hope you're going to try it, it, The great thing is uh, they can be uh, taken out after you color them so you can put them as a nice decoration in the kitchen somewhere or a gift to somebody. Fantastic. Anything like that's so good. So something, yeah, something artistic, you know, yes. whatever, some, some sort of a, a hobby, you know. So you, uh, people get all that. And then um, there's also a lot of resources at the back. So there's how to connect with the sort of international communities of people doing this, which podcast to listen to, mm -hmm. which are wish I'd known about Yard to put you in. Um, oh, so all of I'm all just of starting, but thank you so much. <laughs> and also just to say that the the money doesn't come to me, it goes to the public health collaboration, which is a charity oh. that David and I helped to set up in the UK, which um, spreads spreads the good word about all this knowledge and information. And we've uh, we're just um, launching now as well some some web some web pages under the public health collaboration that uh, that give more information on this on food addiction so that the the website for people is www.phcuk.org and okay. also keep an eye there for the conference information uh for next year definitely conference is something that sounds interesting i don't know about the travel at the moment people are a little bit afraid we had this keto mediterranean retreat in Greece, uh, a lot of people, even including uh, Dr. Jay Wrigley, uh, also Dr. Uh, Barry was supposed to come with his wife, oh. but some Americans or some other people were afraid. So we had a small group of people coming. Uh, it was really beautiful. It was gathering. We showed them how we do it in the Mediterranean, how. So this conference you are mentioning it's a great place to meet people because I think when you meet other people with similar or even if it's totally different story uh, path, you get inspired, you get motivated and you get, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the conference since we are talking about that. Yeah, so we've so there's sort of, uh, in a way, there's three parts to what's going to happen. So Bitten Johnson's coming over and she's doing a four day in, intensive. So that's really for people who like a course, really, like a course, but they really struggle with their food. So it's a it's a food addiction, four day intensive, mm -hmm. just near Bristol. Um, check out her website, bittensaddiction.com for the information on, on that. Mm -hmm. And that'll be residential. There'll be sort of 20 to 30 other people exactly doing what what you're trying to do. And then there'll be six months follow up as well. So you you won't get you won't just get the course, you know, you would, would check that you're um, managing to to keep going with it all. Um, and then on the Friday, so that's just in the few days before, but then Friday, the 20th of May, we're having what we think is the first international conference on uh, food addiction. Mm -hmm. And Bitten, Bitten will be speaking, obviously, I'm speaking um, with some colleagues about a study that we're doing. And we've got Paul Early coming over, who's um, he's the immediate past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and he's a he's a wonderful speaker. So so he's coming, 
and then on the saturday sunday there's the public health collaboration con conference which is always a lot about food but also um sometimes about um movement but it's it's giving it's it's a sort of speakers who it's evidence-based um the sort of nutrition that works for people health wise and the sort of um activities that can help people as well so i'm not exactly who, who sh sure who, who all the speakers are but david and i are always there and david will be a, david will be speaking he always speaks yes, at the yes. hc conference so uh it's a good opportunity to who started low carb first who started eating low carb first Me. Me when I read that book. This is well, important I detail. <laughs> I did it first and I said to him, Oh, this is amazing. This is working kind of thing. And then he wrote it. And then and then he had we had this idea of doing this joint project together in his practice to help people with type 2 diabetes. So that's the main thing that that he's yes, done it with. Focus. But he yeah, he's 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 totally low carb now as well. Uh David has been for, for many years. And we were just looking at some data this morning. So he's now helped. Uh, well over 100 people reverse their type 2 diabetes without drugs coming off drugs oh. so drug drug free diabetes remission it is wonderful uh, this it's is wonderful. Really, really his good. chart uh, i remember my husband constantly uses his chart because i i can see uh, your husband's name popping out uh, of uh, glycemic index it's extremely yeah. important. People don't uh, understand that it's not only important how much sugar it has. The load and the, the index are equally important. How soon it actually uh, rises your blood sugar. And blood sugar. Yeah, and all the charts are available for free at I the know. Public Health Collaboration website. So if people go there and look them up, just put, just go in resources and they'll all be there and if you if you love them um and you use them just make a little donation okay at some point if it's worth something to you to the phv of and course. then then the, the work there can can continue and uh, expand definitely and also i'm inviting all our viewers to check out the website and to donate or to help in any way uh, because this thing is many people don't understand most of us are doing this not for the money, but for the uh, the word to be spread. We want yeah. the word to reach uh, as many people as, uh, because we feel like, hey, it worked for me. Everybody should know about it. Exactly, you kind of, you, you know the difference it's made in your own life. And you know, a lot of people don't know that information. I didn't know it until my late forties, mm -hmm. um, even though I'd been, you know, kind of trying everything and I'm a psychologist but I hadn't put two and two together <laughs> until then so yeah definitely can make really dramatic differences in people's physical and mental health that's what we've really found as well in the work that David and I have done together the the difference to people and how they can come off you know lots of medications that you know they thought they might be on for life but actually they don't need to be and they can um you know they can come off those and and get away from the side effects and and the other problems the other problems have them, uh, them wonderful. With them. wonderful so uh join forces you and your husband and the same my husband and me we are doing as much as we can for the greeks in greece and also in my country in this part of ex-yugoslavia croatia uh herzegovina and the rest and we really hope that maybe in one of the next Greek Ghost Keto Mediterranean uh, retreats, we will have the two of you visit us and be our guests. That I would love be that. nice, wouldn't it? That would be, <laughs> it would be really amazing. nice. Thank so, you very much, Dr. Jen. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And I hope I can invite you to talk to me again. Like, let, yeah, we anytime. have so many different subjects that we could cover. Yeah, anytime. Thank you. Thank you.